ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome back Michael Kimmelman and his guest, U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan. Yeah, I know. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we just had a panel that uh, included Dawn Zimmer, who's the mayor of Hoboken. Perhaps she's still here. And we, uh, she brought up the Rebuild by Design uh, initiative, which is, which is yours. Perhaps you could explain what it is and, uh, and what you hope it does. Well, um, very simply, it's an international competition to try to bring the best ideas about resilience and the best science from around the world to help this region rebuild in a way that's smarter and stronger. Um, I think maybe a little more uh, interestingly, it was hatched when uh, I took my family on a detour from a family vacation over New Year's in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Uh, much to the chagrin of my 14 and 12 year old boys, uh, I told them we were going to tour flood protection measures on our family vacation in the <laughs> Netherlands. And um, what I saw there, uh, I, I met a gentleman named Hank Ovink, who's here and I think is, is part of this, uh, this conference later today. Um, what I saw was not just a country that had been grappling with water um, and how to prevent flooding for uh, generations, mm. but also a, a kind of culture of, of resilience, that, that this was something that people understood intrinsically was a risk to them, and that it wasn't just about the government getting involved, it was about them individually getting mm. involved. And so part of what we were trying to do with this competition was obviously bring the best engineering and science um, and actually learn about what the risks were for the region, um, but also to figure out ways to engage communities in understanding the risks and, and participating in building not just, well, once a storm happens, how do we rebuild, but every time we build a sidewalk, every time we plant a tree, every time we uh, build a piece of infrastructure we don't tend to think of, like a park uh, or, or transit as part of resilience for climate, to, to make that part of our, our thinking in a broader way. We don't have a culture of resilience in this country, obviously. Uh, and we do have a culture of disaster response. We've had that historically. I mean, by the way, why is that? What is it about America that we have this culture of disaster response, but not so much preparedness? Well, look, part of this is the reality of our topography and, and the risks to us, at least historically. And I do think they're changing because of climate change. Um, but if you think about a country like the Netherlands, right? 60% of their GDP is produced below sea level. And I don't mean underwater, I mean on land that is below <laughs> sea level. And so for them to survive, it, has to, it, it had to be part of this longer term thing. And look, New Orleans is a, is a city that has lived with, and much of, of at least southern Louisiana has lived with this kind of risk. There are other places in the country that have, have had somewhat more of a, a culture, but most of us have not traditionally been at risk in the same way. And, and I do think that a big part of what's driving this is there is a changing perception. Mm. It's, it's not about science. It's not about, it, it is about the reality of what families and communities are facing in their day-to-day -day lives that is beginning to change the way the country is, is thinking about not just response, not just how do we move food and water and emergency supplies in response, mm. but how do, we, how do we protect? And there's a growing body of evidence that says for every dollar that we invest in resilience, we save four dollars from the next event. Um, and so, particularly in a time of limited resources, it's actually smart to invest in resilience. Right. I mean, this economic argument also, uh, Dawn was making in terms of the preparedness in, uh, uh, in Hoboken, it's, it seems like uh, politically um, a no-brainer. You know, you, you spend less. Uh, it seems like a bipartisan kind of idea. You spend less, you, you create a more resilient place, and you don't uh, spend it on the other end. Um, but obviously we have, you know, we, we'll get to in a moment to the governance question, but this cultural question too. So after Katrina, there were certain logical things that were presented as a good way to address you know, the next 
flood there. And they met with what are perhaps the inevitable uh, uh, problems, uh, community uh, resistance, uh, even from people who uh, might have benefited from some of those initiatives. So, I mean, maybe this is, uh, maybe you could speak a little bit to what we learned from Katrina and why Katrina showed us that you can have plans that make sense economically and socially, but that are very difficult to, you know, push forward politically. Well, look, part of this is just the reality of, of money, right? It is hard, and we don't traditionally as a, as a country have a significant set of programs that are focused on this issue of, of resilience. Um, President's actually proposed for next year a, uh, a resilience fund, a billion dollar fund that would start us really in that direction. Uh, there are programs at FEMA that are small, there are others that um, have done this to some degree, but it hasn't really, we haven't built a culture of right. investing in that at the federal level. And, and frankly, when a community is overwhelmed by a disaster, the federal government is often the most important source of, uh, of resources. And in fact, in some ways, we've worked against that hmm. historically. What we saw in, in Katrina, for example, is it was pretty easy to get money to rebuild the schools where they were. Um, it was much harder to actually say, well, well, wait a second, is this really where we should rebuild a school? Is this really where we should rebuild housing? And so a lot of what we've been doing since Katrina, we try to do this in, in Sandy in a number of ways, is to at least you know, uh, get the government, the federal government out of the way mm -hmm. of doing more resilient things. And then I, look, this is, mm. these are very, very difficult decisions to make, right? And, and the most extreme example is how do you help a community make the decision that they shouldn't rebuild in that place? I'll never forget walking through a neighborhood in Cedar Rapids uh, after they'd experienced their second 500-year event hmm. in, in 17 years. All right. I mean, and, this... And, and, and this was a neighborhood where a couple of years after the floods, you basically had two or three families living on each block. Most folks hadn't moved back. But for those families, and I talked to a number of them on their porches, they said, look, my family's lived here for 50, 100 years. I know the government's not going to help me rebuild, but I don't want to leave right. my home, right. right? And so what it really takes, and we're, you know, there are buyouts happening in Staten Island and in New Jersey, right. you know, what it takes is a process that brings a community together to really make a decision together in a way that they're helped to understand the science, but also that they participate in that process in a way that really is, it's difficult. But when it works, you have a community that can come together and, and make a decision that is the best for the future. I mean, you know, a few things come to mind. One is that, of course, in the Netherlands, there were a series of disasters, which, I mean, it's not just that historically they have built below sea level, it's that there were disasters which finally created the realization that the country had to deal with this. Um, and, you know, there's a question of how much we need to actually absorb the idea that these are problems. The droughts as well as the floods are things we're gonna to have to live with for a long period of time. Um, but you mentioned Staten Island, so t tell me about this particular case because that is one of the examples of a community that finally said to itself, I gather, you know, maybe, maybe we don't wanna live here. What, what separated that community from others? Well, look, actually, Michael, let me, let me just take the point you made before because I think it's an important one. I don't wanna let it, let it go. Um, the reality is, I think, I think the numbers like the 12 hottest years on record have all happened in the last 15 years. Mm. Uh, the frequency of storms and other events, it, there's very clear evidence that we are going to, as we go forward, have more frequent severe weather events, other types of events that uh, you know, increase heat uh, loading in our cities and a whole range of things that we have to deal with. And, and I will say, having now in this job over the last five years, been to 46 states, um, having looked in the eyes of families that have suffered from tornadoes, floods, fires, a, a, a broad range of disasters, this isn't about an abstract concept mm. to them. This is about a, rec a fundamental recognition that I do think is growing in the country that we are at risk and 
we've got to do something. And, and this is why a central part of the climate action plan the president put out last summer was, you know, what do we do to cut carbon emissions? That has to be, you know, the first priority. But we also have to prepare our communities better for these kinds of events. And, and that reality, I think, is starting to build a, a, a culture, certainly within the administration. I'll never forget one of our cabinet meetings. Uh, Janet Napolitano was passing around a map of all the disasters that had happened in the past year. And it was a, a frightening thing to, to look at. And, and one member of the cabinet said, and the locusts? Where are the locusts? <laughs> and the agriculture secretary actually said, well, you know, we have had a break. <laughs> They're um, coming. But, but the reality of what we're, what we're seeing in this country, yeah. uh, of Sandy and Katrina and the broad range of disasters, it, it, it requires us to think and act differently. Right. So Staten Island. Yep. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is a, the, when you and I first began to talk about this right after Sandy, one of the issues I kept raising was this governance question. You had communities which really should not be building or rebuilding, I should say, in certain areas. And yet, as you say, people, they've been there for generations or they, they believe they have, it's, there's a whole fundamental property rights issue in America, which is deep in our national identity. So, <clears throat> you know, there, there are carrots and sticks and there are fears and hopes that get people to move. Um, what happened in Staten Island that people decided, okay, this is a place which we realize is maybe unsustainable? Well, part of it is, that at, at some point, the public sector has to say, we have a choice to make in how we help people rebuild, right? And creating a set of uh, rules, of, of programs that say, look, if you are in a highly vulnerable area, we just, we can't responsibly make the choice to help you rebuild. That's, so that's, that's one piece of it, and maybe you'd mm. call that the, the sticks, but I mm. think, the, the carrots part is equally, if not more important. One is, and I think this is a fundamental responsibility of the federal government, is to help citizens understand what their risks are. Yeah. And we haven't traditionally done a great job of that as a, as a country. We've, we've made a lot of effort. Uh, President really recently uh, announced a new climate data initiative that is trying to put the hands, uh, th this information in the hands of, of folks. We did this for, for Sandy where we created a tool where you could go and click on a, on a website, go down to the you know, street level, even your house, and see what does the next 50 or 100 years hold for you know, your community from mm -hmm. the best science that we have. So that's, part of it is arming citizens with information, information about, about the risks. And part of it is working with them. I've seen this in, in many, many We tend to have our most vulnerable communities, the lowest income, tend to be the most likely to be hit by these storms. They tend to be in the most vulnerable areas is to really help them understand what are the options available to them and, and often bringing them together with a locally based community group that they trust to say, you know, let's all come together and decide, do we as a community mm. feel like this is the right thing to sponsor about? Because ending up with a checkerboard of you know, a few houses here and there um, isn't an ideal outcome for, for anybody. It's not but economically to, feasible for a city to that, continue right. to maintain. Yeah. but to try to make that decision together. And that's what happened in Staten Island. I think the city, um, the, the local community leaders did a great job of banding together and saying, look, this has happened too many times. Mm -hmm. We need to make a different decision. And a, and a huge share of the uh, residents of that community ended up making a decision to take a buyout. And, and we made those resources available. We helped them figure out where they could move, what homes mm -hmm. would, might be available to them, all of those sort of tools we made available, I think, and, and the local government made available, and community leaders um, really made, made the difference. You know, as you're speaking, and we were talking a little earlier on the panel, too, about sort of integrated thinking and, and how, you know, resilience works with economic development, I wonder whether there is, whether resilience uh, and sustainability aren't the kind of politically more complicated uh, concepts than economic development. In other words, maybe the concept of resilience as the goal um, is, uh, should, should always be tied to the questions of economic and social improvement. If people saw the kinds of things that they're doing towards creating more resilient neighborhoods and cities and, and communities as actually being economically and socially beneficial to them, was, in which resilience was a side benefit rather than the generating uh, principle of the, of the step, that maybe this would have a more uh, 
um, receptive audience uh, across the political spectrum. I think it's a, it's a great point. And, and look, that is the truth. It is the reality that um, in an increasingly uh, Polarized. climate affected, well, I was gonna say, in a world that's increasingly affected by climate change, mm. uh, a huge share of our population and our uh, economy, world economy, is produced on our coasts. Right. Um, in, in that kind of reality, more and more, I think smart cities, smart regions are realizing that investing in resilience is an economic benefit. And in fact, one of the, I think, more innovative uh, directions that we're seeing, we're trying to pursue on the federal government level, we're seeing others try to do, Rockefeller Foundation and, and others are pursuing is, if in fact this does lower economic risk in the future, how do we capture those benefits? It's, if it's gonna lower insurance costs right. going forward, is there a way to say, hey, Let's capture those lower costs and use them to invest in resilience so that you have, you know, the government doesn't have to come up with 100% of the, the cost of this, and it, and it makes that uh, point. But from, a, from an economic resilience point of view, we need to continue to focus on the fact that this will help make cities more, uh, more vital. Just, and let me give you one example from Rebuild by Design. Yep. Um, one of the teams chose to focus on the Hunts Point food market. It actually wasn't terribly damaged in Sandy. Sandy. The reason was because it was low tide when the worst of the storm hit. Mm. And literally, if it, the storm had happened six hours later, mm. we would have lost most, if not all, of the food source for 22 million people in this region. 22 million. Uh, I was stunned when I heard yeah. that that's, that's what Hunts Point services yeah. in terms of, of this region. Um, and yet, that huge economic driver of, of our region, we haven't figured out how to protect yet. Mm. And so um, by approaching, and Rebuild Design, by Design tried to do this, what are the most important uh, ways that we can think about protecting these, these critical assets and some of our lowest income communities. And there was a convergence of that in the South Bronx right. um, that was very, very important. And in fact, they started to, this team started to look at what are other ways that Hunts Point could actually serve the region during disasters? Could it be a food distribution point? Um, because ships are actually the, the best way after a, a flooding event often uh, to, to, to be move able things. To, to move things. Yeah. Um, and so there were some very innovative uh, ideas there about how to not just protect this incredible economic asset, but also to increase the resilience of the whole region uh, during a storm. Another thing that came up earlier, of course, was that the, you know, we have policies in this country, which are federal policies too, which sort of subsidize sprawl, subsidize highways. You know, when you say so much of the economic uh, engine of the country is on the coasts, you're also describing um, you know, parts of the country that are uh, politically uh, divided from much of the middle of the country. So you know, I, I guess one of the questions is how much of this, um, this issue is like the issue of cities versus uh, suburbs, um, uh, mass transit versus highways. How much of this is a, um, you know, a polarized conversation in Washington. And is Washington really the place where these questions can be uh, fruitfully addressed? Yeah. Look, one of the interesting things, and we, we talked about this a little bit on resilience, when you get to the local level, um, when you're talking to people in a community that, you know, in a red state, in a blue state, independent of that, um, you see an understanding of the, the risks of increasing weather disasters and other things. Um, similarly, on this issue of how we build our cities, I'm seeing, I am optimistic from what I see across the country in this sense. I, I think there, is, there was a growing uh, sense around the country that uh, our cities were coming back, mm -hmm. that we were reinvesting in uh, not every one of our cities around the country, but uh, uh, the majority of them. And that was accelerated by the housing crisis that we faced where um, 
what we quickly realized was that what we used to think of as affordable housing that might be two hours outside a city, right? We used to call it drive to qualify, right? You can't afford a house half an hour from your job, drive another half an hour, keep driving until you could finally afford a house. Right. The reality of that is that transportation costs now make up a huge share of what the average Americans, in many, the average American spend, family spends 52 cents of every dollar they earn just on housing and transportation. Mm. And in an increasing number of areas around the country, transportation is actually more expensive than housing. Yeah. And what that led to, if you look at what happened in the foreclosure crisis, we had a much higher rate of, of foreclosure, much higher losses for homeowners in these communities that were farther from their jobs, farther from transportation options, um, where it was much more expensive to, to get to your job. And what we've seen increasingly is a shift where uh, mayors, uh, local officials, the private sector, uh, the real estate industry are realizing that reinvesting in our cities is uh, smart economics. Um, and partly that's because companies don't want their, their people commuting hours and hours yep. and having these very high costs. But part of it is increasingly in a economy that is based less and less on you know, whether you have the raw materials nearby or whether you have a, a river or a highway that creates a transportation hub, and more and more whether you're a place that attracts um, information technology businesses and other things where you're, you're a place that uh, attracts intellectual capital. Mm. More and more mayors are realizing that if you create quality places, if you create vibrant neighborhoods, diversity, all those things, that you're actually going to attract uh, more economic development. And I see that independent of you know red right. state, blue state. Memphis, Tennessee, yeah. you know, it was there fairly recently with the CEO of FedEx, uh, Republican senator, talking about how we redevelop areas around their airport, the freight airport that's the most productive in the world, but surrounded by neighborhoods that are, um, have seen real, real troubles. Yeah. And by creating better neighborhoods around it, FedEx sees that as an incredibly important part of their economic success. And it's those kind of connections that I think are cre increasingly being realized at the, at the local level, and I, and I hope will ripple through to our national politics yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking of uh, Michigan, as you said, this, you have a Republican governor who also knows that Detroit is nonetheless fundamental to the health of the whole state, or even though it's financially crippled, and so wants to help out in, in Detroit's recovery. But, um, but to just get back to this question of you know, policy conflict, I mean, so I was in Louisville not so long ago and was struck by some of the you know, revival of the downtown area in Louisville and you have really smart people doing interesting things and the mayor there wants to sell the downtown as a place for young people to come and startups and so forth. At the same time, they were sort of uh, building out a new highway system that would also you know, increase this kind of spaghetti entanglement of highways that cut straight through the downtown area. I mean, there's a, there seems to still exist this kind of um, uh, you know, bifurcated thinking that we have about uh, the integration of cities with the areas outside them and how best uh, in the long term to think about development. I mean, here it seems to me the federal government needs to play some guiding role in talking about you know, where, we, where we think our resources need to go, whether it needs to go towards more sprawl or whether it needs to go into cities. So how much is the federal government equipped at this point to, to confront crises like that? So th this is a great question, particularly around transportation, because it is such an essential part of how we develop our, our cities, our metropolitan areas, the whole country. And um, I think what, what we've begun over the last five years under the Obama administration is creating a, a a set of new opportunities around transportation that are having a profound effect. And, and in particular, there's an effort that started with the Recovery Act called the Tiger Program, which has been a, a huge source of investment for light rail, streetcars, uh, alternative transport, biking, you know, new, new sidewalks, a whole range of things that have been hard to fund through our traditional transportation mm. programs. And so I was, I was in New Orleans last weekend. We're working on redeveloping uh, one of the most historic African-American communities, which was devastated by, uh, by Hurricane Katrina. 
the last kind of traditional public housing development there that we're trying to revitalize, with a Tiger Grant, they're putting back the old streetcar named Desire uh, that runs right by the, that site and will connect those residents to a new hospital that's being built uh, you know, about half a mile away that's going to have hundreds and hundreds of new jobs that could actually be an economic benefit to it. So, so that's one very specific example. Would not have happened without, without Tiger. Mm. The big question is, we're going to need to reauthorize our transportation, our big transportation funding in this country. The gas tax is going to run out, likely uh, September, October of this year. And so a fundamental question is whether we can take what has started with these efforts like Tiger and others and build them into the mainstream funding right. that we have for transportation in this country. And that is a big question. Yeah. What's interesting is we've been doing a lot of this work with the Department of Transportation. We have a, a partnership we call the Partnership for Sustainable Communities. And what we see, 40% of the people that come to us for planning grants for this kind of investment are in places of less than 200,000 people. Hmm. We have uh, Native American tribes, we have very rural communities that are really struggling with transportation options. They have uh, an aging population that is having an increasingly hard time driving. What kind of sort of mini transit or other inventive strategies can they come up with that can help their community? So there are, um, I think, seeds of hope in terms of this being an issue that, that doesn't just cut across traditional right. political. Uh, divides and geographic divides, but it's not going to be an easy I mean, so fight. And I think all of us raising our voices and really focusing on this transportation reauthorization bill this year is going to be a critical, critical opportunity. I mean, you raise this very interesting point, which is part of what people talk about when they talk about the, 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 the revival of cities, is not just the millennials moving back in because they want to, uh, they don't want to have car payments and, when, and uh, they want to be in more vibrant places, but also an older generation, aging baby, baby boomers, and people talk about them as you know, people who you know, want to live in a city because they can go to the opera or something. But in fact, we've created this unsustainable kind of uh, um, sprawl for people who are not really capable of moving themselves around. Uh, the transportation network is not suited to an aging population that isn't really able to drive or shouldn't often drive. Uh, so I speak about my mother here. So. I mean, in a certain sense, you have, you have uh, this coming from both ends. You have an older generation and a younger generation, which should both be pushing towards urban development, urban, urban growth, and urban funding. That's, that's where the, uh, and I imagine that politically, that's also uh, an opportunity as well. You're not just selling this on the idea that everyone's going to have a startup in Astoria, Queens, or. Uh, absolutely. And look, there is also the fact that. Uh, those who invest and fund real estate are increasingly aware that, I take Dallas as an example. But you're about to say old, but okay. <laughs> um, in Dallas, homes that were closer to their transit system there held their value 25% better through the, through the crisis than homes that weren't. So there is, there's, there's a market force to this. I think on the flip side of that though, one of the things that w I've been very focused on, the president's been focused on is that there is a risk with this sort of refocusing of development in cities that uh, populations, uh, lower income populations, often minority communities, are at risk of being hurt by the very redevelopment that, uh, that we're talking so about. So how, how so, explain. So um, you put in a transit stop, right. you generally increase value dramatically in that place, right? Um, and what it can often do is lead to housing that's more expensive. And so very simply, a big part of the strategy we're helping cities pursue is as you're doing, as you're better connecting your transportation to your jobs, um, creating more walkable, livable communities, you've got to build into that strategy things like inclusionary zoning, uh, affordable housing investment strategies that make sure what you're creating is an economic mix. Because fundamentally, and we, when I was the housing commissioner here in New York, we saw this dramatically, right? If we wanted to attract the businesses that were going to be the future of this, this city, we needed to have a diverse mix of, uh, of folks. So it's not just morally the right thing to do. It also has an economic Economically, yeah. component uh, as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is, you know, New York is also a city that, after all, developed 
over the course of the last hundred years by putting transit in places and having development follow that. You know, now we have this very much a responsive approach, like, well, there's an area developing now, we need to put transit in. Perhaps if we also think in terms of connecting neighborhoods that can be areas of, of growth for, that, for more affordable housing and, and encourage, encourage the development in those areas through transit, um, maybe then you have, a, you, know, you, have, you have areas that are underdeveloped now but could also be uh, you know, potentially good for the 200,000 units and more that I assume I, I, looking I, I think I might have just seen a good piece by the architecture critic. Yeah, well, a streetcar, yeah, I inevitably, I inevitably talk, drag, drag back. <laughs> yes, exactly, I bring this back. So, so we're talking a little bit about resilience as a good investment, basically, um, yeah. but, and, and the problems of the equity that are related to this. Um, how, how much, so in terms of rebuild, let's get back to rebuild more specifically. How much uh, of the, the rebuild thinking um, is what you might call uh, holistic. That is to say, how much does it you know, focus on particular kinds of engineering or design solutions and how much does it try to um, approach resilience in terms of these other issues of social equity, economic uh, you know, improvement and so forth? So, I think maybe the best way to get at that is to, is to use an example. Sure. We were absolutely trying to get to exactly what you said, where we're not just thinking about an infrastructure solution, but thinking about how do you create this culture of resilience, how do you create economic development opportunities. The, there's one proposal for the very coast of Staten Island that we were talking about for, before where there are buyouts going on, uh -huh. um, and there are places that will be left uh, to become wild again, to become natural again, um, but at the same time, there are lots and lots of folks that can live there safely if we build in a different way. We also uh, recognize that we don't want to wall people off from the, the water. One of the great attractions of um, Tottenville and, and other communities is the, is the beach and the shore and being able to have that contact with water. It's also a critical economic driver. There are clamors and, and others that right. depend on their, uh, their livelihood there. And so the proposal was very, very innovative from an infrastructure and science point of view. It was essentially to build living breakwaters mm -hmm. that depend on rebuilding an oyster population. Mm -hmm. um, it's been shown, that the science is very strong that oyster reefs are actually one of the most effective ways to uh, limit wave power. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing that destroys homes uh, in these storms is generally not just the, the slow water rising, but it's the power of waves that surge. really, the surge that knocks you know, buildings off their foundations. So it, with these breakwaters, you can dramatically reduce the power and intensity of waves. You can create a much more safer place to live in places that are currently at risk, not, the, not the, at the worst risk. But also what was interesting about this is, is they did a detailed study of the clam and the oyster habitats there. They worked closely with uh, the fishermen to make sure that they were actually creating places that would increase the ability to, to farm uh, the, the clams. And hopefully, ultimately, as the, as the water becomes cleaner, the oysters themselves. And they got involved something called the Harbor School, which is a really, on really Staten innovative Island. model. Uh, on Governor's Island. On Governor's Island, but that's now developing a teaching curriculum for students uh, much more broadly than just the one school to teach them about water, about risks, and also to build a career pipeline for them that goes to maybe these kids will be building these breakwaters. FEMA is actually very interested, could this be a model that could be replicated in Florida and other places? And also to connect them to other careers in the harbor of, of New York City. So what you're doing is not only creating an engineering solution, you're creating a, an economic development solution, helping the, also re bringing the waterfront back, which is yeah. a big tourism driver for, for that area, big economic driver. And you're creating a culture within, within young people in that community that they now understand the risk. I got a beautiful letter from one of the kids as part of the application that said not only did he now understand very differently the risks to him, he had educated his parents about the risks of climate change yep. and, and what was happening in their own community. And in a way, if you start with that, that generation, it can be a powerful 
uh, sort of step to building that culture of resilience. Yeah, exactly, this culture. You, you mentioned FEMA and the floodplain, of course, of course, remapping and so forth. So this creates, uh, maybe you could just get a, one of the fundamental problems of doing this. You want to create maps that, are <clears throat> that present real risk. This changes insurance costs for for people in a, in a real way, this becomes a huge political problem. How, what, how does one negotiate this on a federal level? I mean, this is uh, immensely complicated. It, it is, and, and in, in many ways, flood insurance, it's certainly one of the most powerful tools that we have in the federal government to, to shape where people develop, where they don't, and, and long-term uh, patterns. And there was recently, uh, a, a few years ago, there was a bill passed to reform the system to make it much more actuarially sound, mm -hmm. which means that there would have been huge increases, uh, indiscriminate increases across the board uh, for people living in, in communities. And, and look. And often in communities, poor communities, obviously. Exactly right. And so what happened is we saw a major backlash right. to that. And a new bill was passed just uh, within the last month or so, which rolls back some of those increases, but also creates the ability to uh, really focus on those who can't afford flood insurance. Because I think, as in so many other challenges, like the, the buyout situation that we were talking about, the, the challenge is how do you get to a situation long term that is safer? How do we encourage development patterns that uh, don't put people needlessly at risk, that don't harm the environment, um, that, that protect us better from climate change, but to do it in a way that makes sure that current residents aren't dramatically hurt, that you're not devastating these communities in the short term while trying to build for the long term. While trying and, to save them, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and creating that sort of compromise and, and negotiating that is, is as hard a thing, uh, you know, I feel like that's a challenge I face all the time in public policy. And this was a, an enormous example of one, which affected millions and millions of people on our coast. And, and 40% of the people who live on the coast are low and moderate income around the country yeah. that are in floodplains. We, we tend to think of them as well as second homes, or but the fact is we have lots and lots of vulnerable people living on our coasts. And so I, hopefully what this bill will lead to, I'm, I'm not gonna say it was perfect, but it gives us an opportunity to find a way to protect current residents, uh, make sure there's a, a transition while building towards a, a, a more resilient uh, future. Yeah. In, in those areas, I mean, with one of the most powerful financial levers that we have. Yeah, I mean, in New Orleans, you had a similar situation. There was, as I said, these plans, which which had many, you know, uh, both environmental and economic benefits to them. But they uh, they clearly would affect uh, often very poor neighborhoods, uh, which felt that they were being targeted actually by these plans. So the plans had to had to modify, uh, be modified as well. Um, with some compromises to the you know, immediate resilient uh, impact. Yeah. But I guess this is politics. Well, look, it's also, it is politics with a small p mm -hmm. a lot of times, and I mean that in, in the good sense of politics, that, one, and this is one of the major efforts in Rebuild by Design, is we wanted to start with the best science, you know, the best ideas around the world, but we also wanted to start with the communities that were affected, and so, um, it, it was, I will say, it was very moving to me on the jury when we had teams that came and presented. Some of them came with 100 members of their community um, that represented an incredibly broad and diverse set of folks who were saying, you know, public housing residents and a whole range of others saying, this is the best chance to protect my community. Yeah. And I've been part, this isn't just they came in, you know, gave me a slideshow, I've been deeply involved in how to figure out the future of my community from, from the beginning of this process. And, and fundamentally, if you can create that kind of engagement, I, Hunt's yeah. point is a, good, is a good example again. One of the deep ironies of this process was as the team began, they figured out you've got a food source, uh, a market that is serving 22 million people right next to the poorest congressional district in the entire country that has a big problem getting access to fresh food. Yeah. Right? How can that be? Right. And, exactly. and so one of the things that the team took on is solving that exact problem, mm. to create a, a way for those residents to benefit from that market. The presence of the market. Door. And that wouldn't have happened yeah. 
had the process started with an engineering solution, yeah. right? Yep. Um, so that's, that's the way, yes, it is big picture politics, but it's also local politics in terms of do you engage citizens in planning for their own futures, for their own communities in a way that is real, not just lip service to that. Before we end, I just wanted to turn back to the Netherlands where you dragged your children and, <laughs> and met Hank. Uh, because you know, often um, the Netherlands is held up as an example um, for, for us. Um, and I was struck when I went there by one particular aspect of the, the river program, which I won't elaborate on here because we don't have time, but effectively it was about uh, a community coming together and making a certain decisions for themselves about trying to stay on land that uh, they were going to be forced off of. And the government over the period of, I don't know, 10 or 12 years, uh, coming to an agreement about the compromise, uh, which allowed a number of the people in this community to stay uh, in the polder. Um, that involved the community coming together, making decisions, making hard decisions. But fundamentally, it, it began with the idea, with heart, with science. And the government saying, this is what we need to do, is there's a larger good here. It's an indisputable fact. And, Having said that, let's see what we can, what we can work out. Um, it was a kind of compromise which struck me as coming from a culture that had been living with this for a very long period of time um, and that took certain things for granted, like water is a serious problem. Before we end, since the Netherlands are obviously your starting point for this, but we're not in the Netherlands, just describe a little bit of the difference between the United States and the Netherlands in terms of dealing with these kinds of issues. Um, so, I, I talked a little bit earlier about the nature of the risk that they face, right? It, it, is, it is enormous. Um, but because of that and because of uh, what they've experienced over time, this sort of culture of resilience is, is part of their everyday life. Now, Hank and others in the Netherlands would tell you they've, they've made it so safe, they've built their you know, berms and their, uh, their dikes up to a 10,000 year event that they worry that they're losing a little bit of that. But one example, losing, losing, a, little losing bit of, a little bit of that <clears throat> a sense of that there is risk the water, and, yeah. and that relationship to the water, but also the, the kind of culture of resilience. Like I, I personally, as a citizen, need to do things to make sure I'm safe when I you know, when I decide to build a house, when I decide where I'm going to put my utility, all those kind of small decisions that we make that are add up, right. that those are part of resilience as well. And, and there is, I think if you'd ask folks in the Netherlands, they're worried that they're, they're losing a little bit mm -hmm. of that. But what I saw, just to give you one example, we went to one of the enormous uh, pieces of engineering that they built um, to protect the city of Rotterdam. It was the last in a 50-year project that resulted from what they called their Katrina. Uh, it was in the 1950s, I forget yeah. exactly what year. Thousands of people died. It was, it was you know, uh, a terrible, terrible event. This was the very last piece of, and so you have this just magnificent piece of, of engineering. And we go there and there is a little visitor center yep. that every day is filled with school kids that come and look at this piece of engineering and are taught sort of what the water, what the risks of water are to their community. And I, and I still have in my bathroom at home a little sponge in the shape of the Netherlands that <laughs> we, brought, we brought home. And just that idea that every kid, you know, takes yeah. home to their bathtub a little thing, the shape of the country that says, we are a sponge, right? Literally, the country is a sponge. And as, as dumb and simple as that sounds, yeah. there's a level of sort of basic engagement with citizens about, about risk that, that happens there that uh, we just haven't figured out in this, in this country. And, and it's something that was an important part of Rebuild by Design. You, you heard about Hoboken earlier. One of the, t the team for Hoboken came up with these brilliant ideas about how to use bus stops in the city to say, you know, here's where Sandy came. Here's the line at this literal bus stop where the water might come in 50 years or 100 years. Just those kind of small gestures to help make sure people information. think about this. It's information. And, and, and at the national level, I will, I will say, only the federal government really has the ability 
to bring together and provide that best science. I talked earlier about this tool we created yeah. for Sandy. But what we can leverage, and this is where I think we can do this in a kind of uniquely American way, uh, our climate data initiative, not only are we bringing together the best data around the federal government, we're actually releasing it. And companies like Google and Esri and, and others are actually taking that data. They're sponsoring hackathons and all kinds of other ways to get individual citizens, programmers, companies to think of really innovative ways to use that data and make it available to citizens, right? And we have a powerful opportunity with, right now, with uh, our you know, incredible strength around technology in this country to really find new ways to, to build that culture of resilience uh, among citizens that uh, we want to grasp that opportunity. We don't want to let that opportunity pass. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for your time. It's My pleasure. pleasure. Great, thanks. Thank you.